Welcome to our program tonight, Polygamy, What Love Is This? I'm your host, Doris Hansen, and we are broadcasting live from Salt Lake City, Utah. This is a telephone call-in program, and we do invite our viewers to call in. And we especially invite our polygamous viewers to call in when we open up the telephone lines. Our telephone number is 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. Our email address is tv at aboutpolygamy.com and we do invite your emails to make comments about the show or perhaps something that you would like to see us cover in future programs. A web page for, uh, for the show itself is www.whatloveisthis.tv and you can go onto that web page and uh, just see little things, little interesting tidbits about the show and about the people who work here. And also you can watch previous programs on streaming video <clears throat> on that website. In the spring of 2007, a DVD uh, was released entitled Lifting the Veil of Polygamy. And at that time, this ministry as Shield and Refuge was established. Although we had been doing work behind the scenes before that time, reaching out to uh, people in polygamous groups and asking questions and, and just being there for them, uh, we weren't really official until two years ago. Since that time, we've had the awesome op opportunity, numerous opportunities, to help and talk with and advise and reach out to many people in many different polygamy groups who question their polygamist involvement. We've helped people escape from different polygamy groups as well. We have and we will continue to help those who contact us and ask us for any needed help and encouragement that they have. I say all this because contrary to what some people are saying, I have no ax to grind. And those who think that I do have no idea of the road that I've taken and they have seriously misjudged me. I did flee from a polygamy group many years ago and when I left, I took a bundle of hurt and pain with me. And I didn't know there was such a thing as healing for that pain. And 25 years later, I found the truth. And in that truth, I found the joy and the forgiveness and the salvation in Jesus Christ. And through that, I was healed. I deeply love the polygamous people. I know there are hundreds of them. There are many polygamous people right now as we speak who would leave their polygamous situation if they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God would still love them and that they would still have opportunity for heaven if they left their polygamous situation. And that's what this ministry is all about. It's to witness to the truth that salvation isn't through polygamy. It has nothing to do with any axe grinding. If you are trapped in polygamy, perhaps by your fear of uh, what would happen to you if you left? Would you be able to survive on the outside? Or perhaps because of fear of, of hell and hellfire and damnation, which I'm sure you've heard about. Please know this. We care about you, and we're here to help you. God loves you, and He does not require polygamy for your salvation. We will do everything possible to assist anyone in complete confidentiality. You're not alone. We are here to help. We have no hidden motives. We have no hidden agenda. All of our assistance is done in the love and in the care that Jesus Christ himself modeled for us. For more information about who we are, about how we can help, and about polygamy, you can go to our website, shieldandrefuge.org, and you can find information there about whatever you need to know. You can contact us from that website as well if you have questions or comments. And um, if you or anyone that you know is in a polygamy group and is either being abused or maybe being forced into something they're not comfortable with, or maybe even forced into a marriage they don't want, you, of course you can always call the emergency number 911, but you can also call our toll-free number. It's 877 Four two five nine 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 three, and you're welcome to call us at any time if you have questions or comments or need some help. 
We have monthly discussion group in the Salt Lake area. We have it the third Monday of every month, 6.30 p.m. We'd love to have you if you feel like that you have issues or questions or comments that you just really need to talk to someone about. And we have a good time. It's been very helpful so far for those who have been attending. And we also have an online support group. Uh, of course, you can do work through that one anonymously if you would like. But if you would like to join either one or both of those groups, uh, please email me at tv at aboutpolygamy.com and I'll be happy to give you the information. By the way, anyone that's watching the program tonight, if you are in a polygamy group or if you have been in a polygamy group and you still have issues and, and questions, uh, the DVD that I mentioned earlier, Lifting the Veil of Polygamy, if you haven't seen that, we will send a free one to you if you've been in a polygamy group or if you are currently in one and you have some questions and things that you need to deal with, just contact us somehow off <clears throat> TV, the, uh, TV at aboutpolygamy.com or you can call tonight if you don't have access to internet and leave contact information and we will send you uh, a DVD. Next week our guest will be Russ East. Russ um, had a grandfather who abandoned his monogamous marriage and family and took off and pursued polygamy in a group called the Order of Aaron. And I think that you'll enjoy hearing about that and hope that you'll join us next week. We receive many inquiries as the days and weeks go by and questions about biblical characters who practice polygamy. And so tonight I'm going to answer some of those questions. I'm going to talk about Abraham and polygamy, and I'm going to also talk about King David and polygamy. What seems to confuse many people is that God uh, seemingly uh, tolerated the widespread practice of polygamy in biblical times, and especially by His own people. It doesn't appear that God rebuked Abraham and Jacob and King David and others for their practice of polygamy, and so people just tend to think that it was done with God's blessing. So most, and most of today's polygamists, because of this, actually believe that God's express desire is for them to practice polygamy. As a child, that's what I was taught, and everyone around me was taught the same thing, that the only way to heaven, the only way to please God, was to practice polygamy. But is that true? Is heaven filled with people who uh, are, are got there because they practice polygamy? Or is, and is heaven filled with people who are practicing polygamy while they're there? Now, as I go through um, these scriptures and these biblical characters, Abraham and David, I'd like for you to keep in mind, if you will, and by the way, right now, you might want to get out a piece of paper and a pencil and write down some references. I'm going to give you some good biblical references tonight. You can do your own study when the show is over and see if what these things that we say are true. Uh, Romans 15, 4 says, For whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning. We want you to understand that the things that were written before, talking about the Old Testament, were written for our learning, not for our doing. We have to keep that in mind as we read some of these scriptures. So let's take a look at some of these things and see if we can learn tonight from some of these biblical characters in polygamy. The first question that we had was from a woman. She emailed me in December, and I'm going to read the email to you. And um, her name is Joni, and she said, I don't like the idea of polygamy, but what about Abraham, the father of many nations? Why did he practice polygamy? The LDS Church's belief in polygamy gets justification because this prophet practiced it. I hate how Abraham treated Hagar. I don't see how even a prophet can practice polygamy and be righteous. Why isn't Abraham condemned for this practice, and why do Christians act as though Sarah was right, casting out Hagar and believing Isaac was the firstborn when he was not? The whole idea is reprehensible to me. I can see why the Arabs hate us. Can you explain this to me? Thank you, Joni. Joni, I'm going to explain this to you as best I can. You have a lot of questions there, so I'm going to answer them each point by point. You asked why Abraham practiced polygamy. And my answer here may shock a few people, but actually in the sense 
of today's, the way today uh, people practice it, the way the early Mormons practiced it, and even the way uh, Bible characters of those days practiced it, Abraham didn't practice polygamy in that same way at all. It was totally different, and I'll explain. God had promised Abraham and Sarah a child. They were both in their older ages, and Sarah didn't get pregnant, so they decided they'd help God along a little bit. And so <clears throat> Sarah gave Hagar, or Abraham Hagar, her maid, to get pregnant because the culture was that the maid could get pregnant and give that baby to Sarah, and that way that's how they would get God's promise fulfilled. Well, this was not God's idea at all, and it turned out to be quite a fiasco. But in Genesis chapter 16, verse 5, we read this, And Sarah said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. Now we read in this verse, and we need to notice this very carefully, Sarah admitted she was wrong. And in admitting she was wrong, she also said Abraham was wrong in doing what she told him to do to take Hagar. So we have admission of being wrong there. And then we also have Sarah saying, I have given Hagar to you. She gave Hagar to Abraham. God didn't. And that's what the early Mormons taught, was that God gave Abraham his concubines and wives, and that is not true. We can see it right there in the scriptures. And this was the end of Abraham's dabbling in polygamy, if you want to call it that. Hagar got pregnant right off the bat, and he never went with her or any other woman again after that. And yes, Joni, the early Mormons and some present-day polygamists say that it must have been righteous for Abraham to have done this, but that isn't true. In fact, Joseph Smith said that God had counted righteousness to Abraham because of polygamy. God's accounting righteousness, now write down these references, I think you'll find them interesting. God's accounting righteousness to Abraham is in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And Abraham didn't even start in with Hagar until chapter 16. So if you want to read the context, you'll see that what Joseph Smith said was misapplied scripture. And even in, in the time frame, it was wrong. Abraham was declared righteous because he believed God, not because he practiced polygamy. By the way, God will count righteousness to anyone who places their trust and their faith in Him and Jesus for salvation. You said, Joni, that you didn't see how a prophet can practice polygamy and be righteous, and you are so right. Polygamy makes no man or no woman righteous. Genesis 15, 6 tells us how we become righteous. Uh, Joni, you also wondered why Christians act as though Sarah was right in casting out Hagar. You also said that you hate the way Abraham treated Hagar. Well, Hagar was a victim in a certain, to a certain degree. She certainly was a victim. But God did protect her. If you want to read the whole story, you'll see that she was protected all the way through this. And also her son Ishmael was protected as well. Hagar's son Ishmael was 13 years old, and we read that he was mocking Isaac. Well, Isaac was the son that God had promised Abraham and Sarah, and he was the one whom God was going to fulfill his promise that Abraham would become the father of many nations. Obviously, Hagar was not controlling her son Ishmael to stop him from mocking Isaac. And so God is the one, Joni, that told Abraham to send Hagar and her son away. You might hate the way it happened, but God protected them. He sent them away, supplied their needs, sent them away. And Ishmael ended up uh, marrying a woman from Egypt, and he had 12 sons, and he became the father of many nations himself. Now, you wondered about Isaac being the firstborn. Well, uh, Actually, Ishmael was born first to Abraham. But if you look at the story, you're going to see that Isaac was the firstborn to Abraham and Sarah. And that's who God had given the promise. God had given the promise to Abraham and Sarah, not to Abraham and some other woman. So Isaac was the firstborn. 
And since God did not consider Ishmael the firstborn, it is just another indication, another small proof that God did not consider the, the relationship with Abraham and Hagar legitimate. And as for being reprehensible, I would certainly agree with you. That was a pretty reprehensible story. It certainly is. And the reasons the Arabs hate us have absolutely nothing to do with Hagar and Abraham. Although the, the Arabs are there and um, are a problem because of, what, of Ishmael, but that is not why they hate us. Now you wondered why God didn't condemn Abraham for this polygamous business. And uh, this would be a difficult thing for you to understand if you yourself have not experienced God's grace yet in your own life. You see, Joni, Abraham's sin was that he didn't trust God to keep his promise. And so he took Hagar instead. And his sin also was sexual immorality with Hagar. But what are your sins? What are my sins? Rightfully, God should condemn every sinner. But in His patience and in His grace, He doesn't because His patience leaves room for us to repent. It worked the same then as it does now. In fact, instead of condemning our sins and instead of condemning Abraham and the other polygamists, He came and died on the cross for them so that we could and he could receive his forgiveness when they repent. Abraham repented of his sins, therefore there is no condemnation. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, you're going to read that therefore there is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Have you repented of your sins yet? Acts 3.19 tells us that when we repent, our sins are blotted out. Now that is good news. So that's the story with Abraham. Of course, there's always other questions. There's always uh, other uh, questions that people have and comments, but at least that covered part of Joni's uh, questions tonight. And we're going to deal now with David. We've had a lot of calls uh, and questions of people uh, who wanted to know about David, King David. He was called a man after God's own heart. He was a prophet. God loved him. He, he, his story takes up a lot of biblical space and text. And, and uh, Joseph Smith used uh, the story of David also to back up polygamy. We had a question. I had an email from a gentleman by the name of Mr. Orr. And he asked questions about... 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, and why, um, why God gave David his wives. Uh, by the way, Mr. Orr, I'd like to thank you. Although we don't agree on doctrine, your email was very respectful and very kind, and I just want to thank you for that, considering some that I've received. Uh, so, Mr. Orr, I'm going to answer your questions tonight, and also a gentleman several weeks ago by the name of Bill from Idaho called and said that Nathan had given... Uh, or God had given David his wives through Nathan the prophet. So we're going to talk about that tonight and just see exactly what happened. Did God give David his wives for the specific purpose of practicing polygamy? Joseph Smith said he did, but did he? Section 132, verse 39 of the Doctrine and Covenants claims he did, and this is what it says. David's wives and concubines were given unto him by me, by the hand of Nathan, my servant. Now that's what Doctrine and Covenants verse 39 says. Claims that polygamy, uh, David's polygamy was given to David to do through the hand of God. Now 2 Samuel chapter 12 verses 7 and 8 are the verses that people contest. They really want to know why we're against polygamy, why we say God's against polygamy when we read these verses. So let's read the verses and then we'll talk about them. <clears throat> Second Samuel chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out to the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little... 
I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Now, although the Doctrine and Covenant says that Nathan gave David his wives, we read this in 1 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 3. Now follow closely because this is going to prove my point very clearly. Chapter 14, verse 3 says, And David took more wives in Jerusalem and begat more sons and daughters. So 2 Samuel 12 tells us, God gave David um, thy master's house, thy master's wives, the house of Israel and of Judah. First Chronicles says David took more wives himself while he was in Jerusalem. So what is it? Now the Doctrine and Covenants claims that God gave David his wives and concubines. We don't use the Doctrine and Covenants for proof text. The Bible came first uh, and that's what we, it's, it has preeminence, and that's the only thing that we use. So we're not going to use the Doctrine and Covenants of any proof text at all. But let's look at the context and the reasoning behind what's going in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12 and 1 Chronicles chapter 14. The context of 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 8 is that God had given the kingdom of Saul to David. Saul was dead and now David was going to become king. The, that was an action of God that he did to put everything under David's lordship, under his kingship. When someone's king of a country, everything, belong, everything is under, they can do what they want with what's there. And of course, if you're a righteous king, you're going to do the right thing. Well, and that's what God was telling David. This was after the Bathsheba affair. And basically what he was saying to David is, you had the right to any woman in this kingdom. Why did you take a married woman, Bathsheba? And of course, um, people look at, well, he gave his master's wives into his bosom. Well, who, who is his master? His master, if you read the, the whole chapter, the whole passage, you're going to find out the master is King Saul. King Saul's dead. David got everything, got it all. Everything was under his control. He could do with it whatever he wanted. Now, we know that David did not take Saul's wives and concubines, and I'll prove that to you. Um, first of all, God will never give somebody something that he has uh, declared them not to have. And Deuteronomy 17:17 17, 17 tells us that God forbid the kings of Israel to multiply wives unto themselves. And so God is not going to give David more wives if he's already forbid him to have more wives. That's ludicrous to think of that. God doesn't change. His morality never changes. Now the custom of the day, of course, was for the incoming king to take the possession of all everything that the outgo outgoing king, and Saul was dead, that he had, including the harem. And so that custom put David completely at liberty to take King Saul's wives if he wanted them, though there's absolutely no indication at all that David took his wives or concubines. And I'll show you why. 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 50 tells us that Saul had but one wife. One wife Saul had. Okay, and her name was Ahinoam. Now, take, put your pencil to paper here. Saul was king from 1050 B.C. to 1010 B.C. That's 40 years that Saul was the king. When Saul died, David became king. So he became king in 1010 B.C. And the Bible tells us David was 30 years old when he became king. That means that Saul was king, had been king for 10 years before David was even born. Now, how old do you think his wife would have been? And you think, well, maybe he took a young wife like the polygamy groups today do. You know, they take all these young wives. Well, that isn't very likely, and I'll explain that why to you as well. Saul's wife, first of all, Saul's wife is not listed in the genealogies of David. Go into all of them. You won't find his wife listed as being one of David's wives or concubines. 
And uh, that would be important too, by the way, because the line to Christ, their genealogies are uh, exhaustive. Now Saul's wife gave birth to Jonathan. And Jonathan grew up and became a close buddy to David. They were of an equal age, maybe not exactly the same age, but certainly of an equal age. And so it isn't likely that David is going to marry the mother of his buddy. And even further, David's first wife was named Michael. And Michael was the daughter of Saul's wife. Is David going to marry Michael and then turn around and marry her mother too? Not likely. Leviticus chapter 18 totally forbids that. God called that wickedness. Not likely that David did that. So we cannot believe that David took, actually took Saul's wife. And he didn't have more than one wife. Now let's look at his concubine. According to 2 Samuel chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, Saul only had one concubine, and her name was Rizpah. So Saul had one wife and one concubine. And so is this a huge harem for David, for Nathan to give David from Saul's harem? Not likely. And we've already proven that, that David never would have taken uh, the, the Saul's first wife as uh, in, into his harem. Now, the reason, now I'm going to give you a couple of reasons why I don't believe that uh, David took the concubine either. Her name was Rizpah. Abner, who was the general of the army, or at least the commander of the army, is accused of taking Rizpah for himself after Saul died. The accusation goes through that, but the one that accused him of it was not David. And if David had taken Rizpah or even intended to, the, ac the accusation would have come from him, and that would have been reason to have his head if he had tried to take the king's concubine. There's no way that had happened. And furthermore, many years later, David had been king for a long, long time, even past Bath the affair with David and Bathsheba. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 11, Rizpah is referred to as Saul's concubine. If David had taken Rizpah as his concubine, she would have been referred to as David's concubine, not Saul's. Now, I realize that there are a lot of people who don't want to hear what I just said. And you may be mocking the words I just said, that's fine. Just look it up for yourself, just study it for yourself. And as Jesus said many a time, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. They'll hear, check it out, that's all we want you to do. Check it out for yourself. And I do hope that this clears up a lot of questions that you may have about whether God commanded and blessed the, the uh, biblical men who practiced polygamy and told them they needed to and uh, setting that to rest, we hope. And we'll do further studies of this as we go through the program. Now, we already open up the phone lines. If you want to start calling in, uh, we would love to hear from you. Our number is 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. Anybody have any interesting comments that they would like to say about this? Call us up and let's talk about it. I have some um, phone calls that came in last week that I would like to talk about. Um, last week we talked about um, someone had called and asked if the FLDS and the LDS uh, read the same Book of Mormon. And... Um, we answered that question and talked about that. And then in, in one of my uh, presentations, I talked about a verse in Matthew and also in Mark about it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And a woman by the name of Gloria from Salt Lake City called, and she corrected me. She said that it doesn't say it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle, but it says it's easier for a rich man to go through the eye of the needle. Uh, Gloria, I, I don't know what Bible you're reading, but, and I double check to make sure, and you'll find this verse in Matthew 19 and also in Mark chapter 10, and it does not say it's easier for 
a rich man to go through the eye of the needle. It says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And of course that proves that you cannot bribe or buy salvation. And then you said um, that the FLDS and the LDS do not use the same scripture. Um, I had answered the question that they do use the same Book of Mormon. Now the question was, do they use the same Book of Mormon? And, um, and I had said, yes, they do. You said they don't use the same scripture. That, that's a, I don't know what your meaning is there by scripture, but they do use the same Book of Mormon. I have talked to L FLDS folks and I just wanted to clarify. The only thing that maybe would be a difference is that when the, the LDS church began making so many changes in the Book of Mormon, especially when they changed the passage that said that uh, people would become white or pure and delightsome instead of white and delightsome, then they started uh, to use the older Book of Mormons rather than the newer ones. Other than that, they use the LDS Book of Mormons. So Gloria, I hope that answers your questions. Uh, and as we talk about this, I'd like to clarify something I've done in the past, but with, for our new viewers and all, I want to clarify um, the generic use. It seems like the FLDS name is being used generically a lot, so I'd kind of like to clear that up as well. Um, we'd like to have some uh, phone calls start coming in. If you want to give us a call, 801-973-TV20 and discuss some of these things, we'd be happy to hear from you. Um, <clears throat> I, I notice in a lot of the conversations that people seem to be confused about polygamy groups. Um, the FLDS is not generic for polygamy. There are many different polygamy groups and the FLDS is just one of them. The FLDS has the, the border of uh, Arizona and Utah and they have twin cities down there. One of the cities is in Utah and one's in Arizona. They have El Dorado and they also have uh, places in Texas and also in South Dakota and other places. And they are the FLDS. They're called the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's just one polygamy group. It's probably the largest. Uh, but there's other groups. There's the, um, the Harmston group and they're in Manti. And there's the Kingston group and they're spread out all over the place. Um, there is also the Peterson group, uh, there's the AUB, the All Red Group, As Apostolic United Brethren, and they're all over the place as well. And so when you say FLDS, you're talking about one specific group, not polygamous in general, and so that's the way that I will talk about it too when we discuss polygamy groups. Okay, uh, we have another call that I would like to talk that came in last week. Somebody had called and asked if I knew of any black polygamists. And I said, no, I didn't know of any. I hadn't heard of any and I didn't know of any. And then we got a call from a man who told the operator that he was black and he was a polygamist and he hung up. <laughs> and so we don't know who he was. And I'd like to talk to you. If you're watching tonight, would you mind calling in and we can talk? I guess the first question I would like to ask you would be, um, are you a black polygamist practicing um, early Mormon Joseph Smith type polygamy or are you a Muslim practicing polygamy? You know, uh, and because that's two different things. That, there's totally different worlds apart on the kinds of polygamy there. So I just kind of like to know what type of polygamy you are uh, uh, practicing and maybe ask you a couple of questions. If you're kind enough, if you want to call in, we'd like to hear from you. We also had a call last week from a gentleman named Paul in Kaysville. Now, he took sharp exception to um, our talk and, and the people that call in and, and various remarks about um, the Mormon church being connected to modern day polygamy groups. And I had made the remark that the Mormon church is the mother to present day polygamists and I still hold to that. I believe that's true because polygamy uh, based the way Joseph Smith invented it to be would not be on the North American continent today. Um, if it hadn't have been for him bringing it here, and it's still here. Um, Paul wanted to use that as a comparison with the Protestants and the Catholics, trying to say that if that's the case, it would be the same thing as saying that the Catholic is the mother to the Protestants, and that is comparing apples to oranges. It's not even the same comparison. Last week I had compared Mormon doctrine with polygamy doctrine. 
They believe in the same scriptures. They believe in the same prophets. They believe in the same doctrines. Um, even Mormons still believe in polygamy. The modern day Mormon LDS church still believes in, they just don't practice it. And they expect to practice it soon here. And if they don't practice here, they know they're going to practice or they think they know they're going to practice it in heaven. And so the sameness is all over the place when you compare the two. However, if you want to compare, and I don't want to start a whole new subject on Catholics and Protestants, so please don't call in with that, okay? I'm just talking to Paul's question here because the Protestants protested. They wanted to go back to original Christianity the way Jesus had started it 2,000 years ago because the popes and all of that had brought in a lot of, of uh, verbal um, uh, traditions and a lot of purgatory and, and things that weren't in the Bible, things that had never been taught by Jesus. And so what they did is they protested against that. They moved away from it and started back into uh, regular Christianity, which is exactly what the Mormons need to do right now, is to go back to early Christianity. Not latter day, but former day saints is the best, really. So anyway, Paul, I hope that answers to your question. We have a call coming in um, from Rusty from Midvale. Hello, Rusty. Hi. Hello, you're on the air. Okay, I've muted it, so. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, um, I'm LDS. Okay, I'm a convert. Um, from Catholicism, and on the polygamy thing, um, what I've taught is that it was taken away from the church when it was no longer needed, that it was a spiritual thing, um, and then when, when they, um, you know, migrated here to Utah, uh, polygamy was continued because you had a lot of men that went off to war, and it's like, if it were my sister, I wouldn't do that to my husband, okay? <laughs> she wouldn't become a second wife. But if you can imagine all these women who can't have children, okay? And one of our main purposes as a woman, you know, is to bring up children. Really? So is that what God said in the Bible? Pardon Rusty, me, I'm sorry. Rusty, did God say that in the Bible that that's the main purposes of women is to have kids? <laughs> no, that's not the only purpose, but that's one of uh, the gifts that He has given us: the ability to have children and bring forth mm -hmm. more souls to this earth. Mm -hmm. That's you know, true. That um, is one of the, the gifts. The thing, though, um, I'm, I'm from California. I moved to Utah. And, um, oh, man, that's a no-no. Big time no-no. It's like that was taken away. That was done with. You know, it served its purpose. Rusty, it's done with. <clears throat> let me ask you a question. Sure. You said it was taken away. Yeah. Are you convinced that it was even really given? Yes, I am. Why? I, I believe Why, Rusty, Smith let... had those revelations, the reason being is I've had a near-death experience, okay? And the things I saw, I thought I was nuts. Okay, but the Rusty, just, I saw Rusty, verified, you know, things for me. Just a minute. We, we don't want to go into the near-death experience thing. We want to stick with the, with the idea here uh, of polygamy. Would God command something he's forbidden? Would he do that? If he had, you know, totally forgive, you know, forbidden that, he may have forbidden it for a time. No, he forbids his morality. Rusty, mor his morality doesn't change. <clears throat> Pardon me? God's morality doesn't change. It remains the same through all eternity. He doesn't need any p polygamy or anything else to, uh, to have children be born. And if you want to look at the statistics of early Mormonism, there was never ever an abundance of women. There were always more men in the, U in the territory of Utah and in the Mormon church than there were women. Um, I did check my history and there was a time when they had a militia, you know, to defend, you know, to defend because they were chased here, chased there. And quite frankly, <clears throat> this, this country was, was founded on freedom of religion. And Joseph Smith, you know, this was revealed by divine revelation, and it was also taken away by divine revelation. Rusty, it wasn't revealed by divine revelation. If you want to look in the history of Joseph Smith and his polygamy, mm -hmm. you're going to find out that it wasn't revealed by divine revelation. Why would he have 33 wives, and why would 11 of those women be married to women who were already married? Why would he take two 14-year-old girls as, as a wife? And one of those girls, he threatened her with hell and damnation, but promised her and her mother and father and all her family salvation if she would marry him. 
Does that sound like that's from God? You know, I'm not this sure. Is a, he's just a man. <laughs> Rusty. He's a man. Rusty. He is a prophet. He, no, 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 no. And as no. a man, you know, like we all know, they <laughs> make errors. And you, then they better not pass those errors on as commands from God. Well, that you know, that's just the whole thing. We we have to either believe that God is pure and holy, or that Joseph Smith was wrong. We cannot believe both. You you cannot believe Joseph Smith was right, and giving the the idea that God is commanding things that's against His morality that He has commanded against. Even the Book of Mormon is full of scriptures that condemns polygamy. Well, at that time, you know, that There's, was what brought forth. That has nothing and to And a lot of those marriages were not consummated. In our Doctrine and Covenants, <laughs> it says that it had to be with consent of the first wife as well. And um, I see it says on the, on the thing, Rusty from Midvale. It's not. It's Millville. <laughs> Nobody okay. seems to know where we're at, but we're on the northern part of the state. Okay. And um, our church is rock solid. LDS uh, community is, too, and I feel safe in it. But quite frankly, we need a second wife. Well, and it's not a sexual thing. Rusty, I, I think that perhaps we can cl close this conversation right now. I, we're not getting anywhere with this, but I would, I would heartily suggest that you start studying, truly studying all sides of your church's history, and you will be surprised. And right now, I've got to take some other calls. Okay, thank that's you. Fine. Thank you for giving me this time. You're welcome. Okay, bye bye. Bye. Okay, we have Erica calling from St. George. Hello, Erica. Uh, no, I'm not Erica. Oh, you're not. Well, I, uh, it doesn't sound like you ought to be either. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> my name is Miguel. Miguel? Yeah. Okay, Miguel. Um, welcome to the program. <laughs> <laughs> I sure hope I don't sound like an Erica. <laughs> anyway, um, I just wanted to, uh, a question and a comment. Um, quickly, just uh, before I ask the question to Rusty, if she's still listening, it's really, it's really convenient to say that uh, Joseph Smith was just a man when, when something sounds sour, but when something sounds great, then they say he's a prophet. Right. And, and you know, the, the thing is, is that even though some of the prophets in the, in the Bible made mistakes, they never passed those mistakes on as divine revelation. Right, they sure didn't. So, um, my question is this. I, I, I've known people, and I know people that, that uh, practice polygamy, and I saw it from a young age, and uh, I met some of the different people. Um, I won't mention their names, but I've, I've met some of the different um, uh, polygamous sects. In fact, I used to go out with a girl years ago who was, uh, belonged to a, a polygamous family. And the thing is, is that a lot of those, peop those people grew up, a lot of the girls grew up and married one man, okay, and stayed in the Mormon church, which confuses me because... Um, aren't they taught from a young age that unless they're married to, unless they, they share other women in the relationship, that they're not going to make it to the celestial kingdom? They have that fear in, uh, put into them, and then they, they leave that later, which doesn't make sense. Now they're married to one man, they're in the Mormon church, and they're really staunch Mormon, which doesn't make sense because when I was dating this girl, her brothers didn't really like me too much because of the fact that I'm not a... Um, a polygamist, you know, and I yeah. wasn't looking... What, what group was it? Do you mind telling me? What group was... was what polygamy group? If you, if you don't want to say, that's fine. I just um, wondered. Well, I doubt they're listening, but there was the Bunkers, the All Reds, um, and the Monsons. And so it was, it was probably the All Red group then, right? Well, that's one of the groups of... of well, I, that's one of the groups of the people that I knew. I didn't know a lot of them, but... Yeah. Um, and it, it kind of... It makes me feel funny even mentioning their name because... Yeah, well, well, you know, I have found, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people who will leave polygamy groups will, will, um, will have that void in their life. And it seems like they do one thing or another. They will throw out the baby with the bathwater and just completely reject God altogether. Or they will turn around and join the Mormon church. And, um, and it, it's kind of sad because... Um, the Mormon church, it's the same thing. I mean, it's the same doctrine, it's the same prophets, it's the same scriptures, and yet they feel comfortable with it, and so they will join the LDS church. However, there are several who will leave the Mormon church even after that because it feels too much like the same thing. Well, I want you to know, and I want anybody else who hears this to know that I'm not trying to knock these people. I love these people, uh -huh. and they, they, they love me, um, and they're, they're very caring people, 
the only difference is that they're they're deceived by a doctrine of, of demons. Yeah. It's not a doctrine of God. There's only one salvation, and that's Jesus Christ. That's right. That's in His blood and His sacrifice on the cross. Right. And anything that we add to that is just is just garbage. That's absolutely true. And and Miguel, I, I have other calls to take. I thank you for calling. I appreciate your input, and I'm sorry I called you Erica. <laughs> <laughs> I forgive you. God bless. Oh, thank you. I'm going to go to Erica now. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's go to Erica and see if she'll talk to me. Hello, Erica. Hi, this is Miguel. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, I You're actually really down trying here to in St. George. Me. <laughs> Close enough to the Hawker Boys to be hit on by him a couple times. But I was in Walmart the other day, and I noticed that the FLDS women, they have a large wave in the front of their hair that goes back into a braid. Uh -huh. Is there any significance in that? Oh, uh, well, they they were supposed to keep their hair uh, from, you know, being their, um, I guess, their pride and glory. And so they were supposed to keep it back. And they only could wear their hair down uh, in the presence of their husbands in their home. And so they've just kind of evolved to put their hair up and make it as elaborate and as wavy and pretty as they can under the restriction of having to keep it up. So they've just been creative in the way they're doing it. <laughs> well, that's pretty neat. I wonder how many cans of hairspray it takes to keep well, it Well, I've heard it takes a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to mimic it, and it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it would be. And they, and they pride each other doing each other's hair. They, they've really made it into quite an art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, we have Diana from Sandy. Hello, is this Diana? This is. Well, good. This, you're on the air. Okay, thank you, Doris. Uh -huh. I had a comment about Rusty's um, communication with you. Uh -huh. she, she mentioned the freedom of religion card that I often hear oh, yeah. from LDS people. Uh -huh. And um, I just wanted to say on air that freedom of religion is how we worship, not who we worship. And I know that you know that, but mm -hmm. it's, it's how we, our country was founded on freedom of religion, but it was how we worship, not who we worship. That's true, Diana, and, and also the Supreme Court has already spoken regarding the polygamy issue, and in that, uh, they made the, the remark that although there is freedom of religion, we have the freedom to believe in this country however we want to, we do not have the freedom to practice our religion however we want to. Oh, yeah. That's already been said by the Supreme Court regarding the polygamy issue. Right. Well, thank you so much for your, for your program and the work that you do. You're welcome. Thank you for calling. Okay, bye-bye. Uh-huh. Good night. Okay, we have a, a, an off-the-air question coming in, but it's not completely finished yet, so I will um, read this, and then maybe the question will be ready. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, someone called in, and this is a little bit, well, it's a lot off off the topic here, but I'm going to read it anyway. It says, please, can you tell me where the planet Kolob is, um, where, according to Mormon theology, God lives? Uh, well, <laughs> according to Mormon theology, God really doesn't live on the planet Kolob, but Kolob is the planet closest to where God lives, according to Mormon theology. Kolob means the first creation. And um, I guess we first learn about it in The Pearl of Great Price, um, when Abraham talks about, he saw, looked out and saw the stars in the sky and, and that some of them were very great and one of them was near to the throne of God. And, um, and the Lord said, these are the governing ones, the name of the great one is Kolob. And it's because it's near to him. So that answers your question, I hope, of where the planet Kolob is. But it's funny, none of our scientists have been able to locate Kolob in the in the telescopes when they go out. But anyway, that's what they believe, and so I hope that answers your question. Okay, the, the off-the-air question is, some were made eunuchs from birth, some were made men. Is it not necessary to marry? I'm not sure I quite understand the question, but I'm going to answer it the way I think I'm seeing it. Uh, the Bible says some were made eunuchs and um, from birth, and some were made them by men, of course. So it's not necessary to marry. Okay, this, you know, this is something that is very close to my heart to, to get the truth out to folks who believe that you have to be married in order to please God and in order to find a place in celestial glory. 
It absolutely is not true. Um, Jesus said that some were made eunuchs and some were born that way. And Jesus himself said that um, it's, it's okay not to get married. And even the disciples were wondering about that. And he said some people can accept this and some people can't. So why in the world would a religion come behind what this is taught, plus chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians where Paul's talked a lot about marriage and where he said it's good not to marry. And then the Mormon church come up and say, well, you have to be married in order to have a place in celestial glory, in order for your husband to become a god, which is right from Satan's mouth because he said you could become a god. God said you couldn't. And, and so... Uh, it, it isn't necessary to marry. No, God is, is not a respecter of people. He's not going to tell you that you have to be married in order to get to the highest place in heaven and then make it impossible for some people to get married. And that is not why he brought polygamy because he didn't bring polygamy. That absolutely is not the reason why. There are some people who do better not being married. There are some people who who uh, maybe will join a church and their husband doesn't. Um, and so uh, it, it, they're, they're advised to divorce their wife if, if they're, or their husband if they choose a different religion while they're in the LDS church. All of that is so wrong. It just is not the way God has it set out. Uh, he loves women as much as he loves men, and he has not... Um, demeaned women to the point to where they have to share their husband. That has not been God's will from the beginning, not from Adam and Eve, and it never has been, and it never will be. So I hope that answers your question. No, it is not necessary to marry at all. And at this point, I'll also like to mention there are not three degrees of glory in heaven because the, the polygamists believe, well, uh, and the Mormons believe that everybody's going to go to heaven but it's this, this high celestial glory that we're aiming for through our marriages and through our ceilings and all of that. You know what? There's only one level in heaven and we all get to be with Jesus when we get there and that is the whole point. And it isn't a celestial glory. It absolutely, totally is a myth that the Bible warns us against. So I hope that answers your question as well. Um, Okay, we don't have any more calls coming in right now, so we'll go to something else here. Um, <clears throat> well, it looks like there's one coming in. Um, in, um, well, before I get started on this, maybe I better take this call, simply because this might take a few minutes. Um, Jamie is calling on line one from South Jordan, so let's take that one. Jamie? Yes. Yes, Jamie, you're on the, on the air. Yes. Is your TV turned down? Just a moment. I'll turn it down. Okay. Hurry up. We're getting close. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Jamie? Yes. Uh, are you ready? Yes. Okay. What's your question? I want to know what makes her think that, sh that what makes sense to her as far as God's allowing us to have polygamy and then commanding against polygamy should make all sense to her. She's not a God. God is God. What makes sense to him as a God doesn't necessarily have to make sense to the people here on the earth. Well, you've got a point, Jamie, because if God was something that we could understand... Uh, he wouldn't be big enough to take care of our problems and, 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 and get us through our difficulties. So, no, we don't need to necessarily understand him. We can't. He's bigger and better and greater, and he's our creator. That's correct. And the Mormon people, she stated that the Mormon people do believe in polygamy. The Mormon people at this time, polygamy was was forbidden a hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago now. Yes. And we believe that in order to, to be a polygamist, in order for a man to be a polygamist, he had to be called through the priesthood and of God in order to be a polygamist. It couldn't just be anyone. 
Well, Jamie, the the way it plays out in history, that isn't the case. Uh, so well, I don't care how it plays out in history. Uh, That's how it plays out in the in the Mormon Church. They were called. I have ancestors. Uh, that were Jamie, called. if this if history says that thirty percent of the people practice polygamy, you need to care how it played out in history. Uh, the history of the world is. I'm talking about is, Mormon Church history. The Mormon Church. Yes, 30% of the Mormons, 25 to 30% of the Mormons practice polygamy here in Salt Lake. It wasn't just a... That's right, and I'm, I'm related to them. Okay, we have another and call coming in. I know how they, Jamie, they we, practiced it. We have another call coming in, and, and I've only got a... And the problem is that you guys aren't listening. Ja no, and I'm going to so hang... So <clears throat> producing it on the TV... I'm sorry, Jamie. We've only got a couple of minutes left, and I have to shut you off, and I won't be able to take the next call uh, because it's time to close down. Susan, would you call back? Uh, you are still hanging on the line, or else email me, tv at aboutpolygamy.com. Uh, so that you can uh, voice your question. Uh, regarding the biblical men who practice polygamy, I'd like to tell you a verse in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. It says, God says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. That answers your question. We need mercy. Those polygamists in the Bible time needed mercy. And God says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. That's why we don't read of condemnation in the Bible. Bible for those people who practice polygamy because they repented and they were able to receive God's forgiveness because they asked for it. We need His mercy too. God had, needs to forget our sins if we wanted to get into heaven and He will do that if we will turn to Him and repent and receive Jesus Christ alone as our Savior. So if you're in a polygamy group, if you're living polygamy, why not trade your, your lonely polygamous life for the abundant life and joy? that you'll find in salvation in Jesus Christ. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. We meet Him all the same way, and that's at the cross where He died for our sins. Uh, there's a verse in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 that says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, gift of God not of works, so no man can boast. Perhaps I should close the, the, the show tonight by saying, Polygamy, what salvation is this? Thanks for joining us tonight. We hope to see you next week. Good night. <music>